Hi and hello everyone. What we are seeing in this last phase of this course is the general queuing models in which what we have seen in the previous lecture was a generic GG1Q and we did its analysis through Lindley's integral equation and we showed how complex or how difficult it is uh, if you have to do a complete analysis. It is not that it is impossible, but it involves other tools. But for more general distribution, even for MM1, if you have to do via GG1, what was the difficulty we exhibited? Okay. In general, analyzing such queues is uh, involves complex analysis as well as transform inverse. And since these procedures are complicated, many cases we need numerical methods to do the analysis. Uh, as an alternatively, one can consider developing bounds and at least approximations to the GG1 analysis that uh, we have done in Delhi. So, that is what we summarized in the previous lecture with the analysis of GG1. Now, what we are going to do now is to take up uh, this uh, idea of developing bounds for the performance measures that uh, you know you can develop, which in turn will help us to get approximation methods or approximation procedure or process or whatever you want to call it. But that we are not going to touch, but we will just concern about the bounds. At least you know will give us an idea about you know how one can develop bounds directly so that it is still of some use, right? So that is what is the idea here. As we just said that uh, for many queuing systems, direct analytical methods are not available and hence bounds and approximations may be developed for such systems. Bounds are very useful, you know, in many cases, right? Even in not here, in anywhere, in any mathematical analysis that you do, bounds are always helps us to get a very generic result. You know, you don't need to put too much of assumptions on the model in order to get a bound. That's a general nature, right? So, because they provide always the best case and worst case scenario, right? Lower and upper bounds. Uh, will give you the those kind of scenarios depending upon how you view it. It is so one is the best case, the other is the worst case scenario that is possible in such situation. So, say for example, in our case with an upper bound in mind, right, suppose if you say the number in the system is this is the upper bound, right, then accordingly one can decide on the number of servers so that the congestion does not exceed a desired threshold, right. Suppose if your objective is to keep the number of customers with in a below a certain level in equivalently in terms of the congestion probabilities. So typically, this will be specified in terms of those congestion probabilities. Then it will be below a certain threshold, then one can think right. Upper bound can give you the you know the worst case scenario and uh, based upon that then you can decide the number of servers. Okay, so, then you are sure that it is never going to exceed based upon that assumption, right. And also that that is the way you know one would look at it and also approximations can be developed based on the bounds. For example, one very simple approximation that one can obtain is for example, you take the upper bound and lower bound and you take a simple average of it, you know, it is a approximation. There are various ways of you know how one can utilize these bounds to develop approximations. As we said that we are not going to look at the approximation, but at least bounds you know we can derive it here. Okay. So, we consider here uh, the upper and lower bounds for the mean delay in uh, mean line delay or mean delay in Q for a typical customer in the steady state GG1 Q as a function of first and second moments of its uh, interarrival and service times because it is GG1Q. So, what you know is its mean and variance of this interarrival time as well as service times, right. Now, based upon that one can develop uh, bounds that is what we are going to look at it, okay. Further like we will also derive, we will not derive that, we will you know just state it the lower bound when full forms of the interarrival and service time distributions are known. but somehow this is not helpful to get the complete analysis. So, you want to use it at least in to try to de derive the bounds. Okay. 
So, now this as we said like can be used to derive approximation. So, that is what is the idea. So, we are going to look at the bounds for the mean line delay of a steady state g g 1 q is what is our interest which means w q uh, we are trying to get the bounds for that which in turn can give bounds for the others right that is the way in one would look at it ok. Fine, before we step into obtaining bounds uh, there are certain basic relationship that exist for single server queues which helps us to obtain the bounds ok. So, we look at several basic relationship. Uh, we are not looking at all in some sense whatever we require to develop the bounds only those quantities we are looking at it. So, so we are assuming a stationary g g 1 q with rho less than 1 which means a stable queuing system. Now, the relationship involves the inter arrival times, service times, idle period, waiting times and inter departure times. So, inter departure times possibly we will not do anything, but at least that is also possible to obtain that. Now, recall uh, when we derived the Linlay's integral equation, we started with the basic equation for the line delay which is given by this expression, right. So, the, the line delay of n plus 1th customer is related to the line delay of nth customer through this process where this u n is just the difference between the service time of the nth customer and the inter arrival time between nth and n plus 1th customer is what this s n and minus this t n and this u n and w q n plus u n maximum of 0 or this quantity was was this. This is what we have developed earlier. So, for us also like this is now the, the starting point. Now, in addition to this uh, w q n plus 1 which gives the delay of the n plus 1th customer in terms of the de line delay of the nth customer right uh, which is again you can easily understand that what would be this person's delay or this previous person's delay plus uh, the previous the service time of the nth customer minus you know the inter arrival time is what then would be additional increment or decrement to which you will add to this w q n is what uh, you, know, you will get here right that is you can easily understand. Now, in addition to this now let us define this quantity x in the superscript n to be this quantity ok. I mean the quantity that we are looking at is this one only w q n plus u n r 0 a negative of this minimum of these two. Now, what does this represent? As you can see that this is the time between the departure of nth customer and start of the service of the n plus 1th customer, right. So, that is what this x n would represent, right, which you can easily see by looking at you know the different cases that might happen that is what you know you would get here and that is the time between departure of the nth customer and start of the n plus 1th customer. Like by the same argument that you know you have said this you know you can also see that this is what is happening. Now, once we see this quantity here then if you sum these two quantity what you are going to get if you are going you are going to get exactly equal to this quantity. This is one of the important equation in our scheme of things. So, basically the sum of these two are uh, difference ok. So, I am taking this minus other side or whatever if you take it. So, w q n plus 1 minus x n right minus x n would be so this. So, suppose now since this involves minimum or mix maximum of the same quantities which are 0 and w q n plus u n. Now, if, if this is positive right then this value is going to be 0 and this value is given by this expression right that is what you know you will get here. Now, if this is negative right then the minus x n is going to be this quantity and this quantity is going to take value 0. So, you can easily see from this maximum and minimum of this function by looking at the cases when 
this quantity is going to be strictly positive this is going to be the equal to the quantity and this is going to be 0 and if this is negative then this quantity minus of x n is going to be this that this quantity and this is going to be 0. So, you can easily see. So, in both the cases if you take the you know the sum or difference whatever you want to consider sum I would say w q n plus 1 plus minus x n that is what you know you are calling it as a sum otherwise you take it a difference. Okay whatever be this quantity is equal to this quantity in both the cases that is what you are seeing it here. Now, for a stationary q which means that you when you let this n tends to infinity right what you are going to get uh, is that this is going to be this right. So, the expectation of this is going to be the expectation of w q n n or n plus 1th customer waiting time they are going to be converging to one random variable. And so, what you do you take expectation on both sides of this equation as the as this relationship then what you are going to get is basically this quantity right because this will get cancelled then your expectation of x is equal to minus times expectation of u and what is expectation of u? u is the difference between now in the stationary in the limiting case it is a service time minus the interarrival time right. So, which is basically 1 by mu minus 1 by lambda, but there is a minus here. So, this will become 1 by lambda minus 1 by mu. So, what you are observing is that expectation of x which is equal to expectation of minus times expectation of u is equal to this quantity in terms of the means of inter arrival time and service times. Now, what is x? We just said that it is a time between the departure of nth customer and start of the service of the n plus 1th customer. So, that is what we said that when you define this. So, we also have this expectation of x to be probability that the system found empty by an arrival multiplied by expected length of the idle period which is equal to a naught times expectation of i i is the idle period. The a n's are as usual the arrival point probabilities. So, what is the time between a customer departure the between a customer departures right and the start of service is what then right. So, this will be if it is not empty it is immediate right, but if only if this will have some positive value only if it is in empty when an arrival finds uh, when the empty system is there right. So, that is what this expression is ok. Now, that means expectation of i is equal to expectation of x by a naught and expectation of x is minus times expectation of u by a naught which is equal to 1 by lambda minus 1 by mu divided by a naught. So, this is what is the expected idle time is what then you are seeing it here. So, this is the first relationship that we are obtaining it here the expected idle time in terms of the mean of inter arrival and service time distribution and in terms of the arrival point probabilities. Okay. Now, we obtain a formula for the expected weight for a stable g g 1 q in terms of the first and second moments of u and i that is what is the objective that you know we are trying to do here. So, square this relationship again we said this is the important relationship in our scheme of things. So, you take the same relationship you square both sides. So, what you will get in the left side w q n plus 1 square minus twice w q n plus 1 and x n plus x n square the left hand side and the right side also it is a plus b whole square. So, you are getting this expression. Now, look at these quantities right. So, w q n plus 1 and x n this is equal to 0 because by definition w q n plus 1 and x n the way we have defined right. So, one of them is 0 the other one is will take some value. So, the product is 0. So, this term would become 0 and w q n and u n are independent u n is the difference between service time and the inter arrival times and this is the waiting time. So, we generally these are all independent quantities. 
So, that means this WQN and UN these two quantities are independent. Okay. So, you observe that this quantity is 0, so this goes away and this is independent. Now, you take expectation on both sides. Again in stationarity like this quantity would be same as this quantity, so that gets cancelled. This quantity is already 0, so this will be expectation of x square that is what you have here. Here 2 times expectation of this into expectation of this because these two are independent. So, this quantity expectation of w q n is simply w q and expectation of u plus expectation of u square or otherwise w q equals expectation of x square minus expectation of u square by twice expectation of u. This is what you are seeing it here. Right. But what is expectation of x square just like earlier you know we have seen it here expectation of x. This is the probability that system is found empty by an arrival multiplied by expected length of the idle period square right that is what expectation of x square is because the other thing is 0. When system found non-empty then the length of the idle period is 0. So, this is what you will get this as expectation. Now, what is this quantity right? So, this is what is the case. So, a naught its expectation of i square is what then you are having it here. Now, if you plug that here into this expectation of x square you will arrive at this expression a naught expectation of i square minus expectation of u square. So, this x we have now transformed to i in terms of the idle period. So, this is what is the expression now we obtain. Now, Right. We already know expectation of u is minus times a naught expectation of i. Right. Hence, we have, so this is we have already obtained. Right. So, this quantity is we have already obtained. Look at here, this is what you know we have obtained here. Right. So, that means if I plug it here expectation of u in place of that if I plug it there, then this is what then you will arrive at. Okay. So, there is a a naught here this will get cancelled and this is what then you are going to obtain here. right? Minus times expectation of i square divided by twice expectation of i minus times expectation of u square divided by twice expectation of u. Okay. So, this is what is the an expression a relationship between the mean line delay in a gg1 q which you are expressing in terms of these random variables i and u. i is the idle period, u is s minus t, right? That is the difference between the service time and the inter arrival time is what then u, its moments in terms of first and second moments of that you are writing this. In case of Poisson arrivals, you know, one can check that if you are assume the Poisson arrivals, then this is basically would reduce to your pk mean value formula. Okay. Now, like here we, we just squared it this relationship to get this expression which is for expected value of the line delay. Now, if you cube that particular expression if you take the power 3 of this expression on both sides and do similar uh, substitutions and finally, you would see, get a, a expression for the variance of the weight in the q. This is the mean of the weight in the q, variance of the weight in the q also you can obtain it. Anyway, we are not interested in that, so we are not going there, but it is possible to obtain that. Way. Okay. Now, once we have this relationship uh, we have derived, we have obtained. Now, like one can also you know obtain some relationship for the inter departure time and so on. If it is required, you can do it fine. Otherwise, for our scheme of things that is not there, so we just skip that. Okay. Now, what we will do? We will try to obtain some bounds for the single server queues using these relationships whatever we have established. Okay. So, we are as usual we assume a gg1 q in equilibrium which is with rho less than 1. Uh, we will first derive a lower bound on the mean idle time. Recall that the mean idle time is basically expectation of x by a naught or minus expectation of u times a naught r 1 by lambda minus 1 by mu divided by a naught but you can immediately see that a naught is strictly less than or equal to 1. So, expectation of i is simply greater than or equal to the difference between the mean inter arrival time and 
the mean service time. So, the, so E of i must be greater than or equal to this. So, this is the first you know, relationship that we can easily obtain here. Okay. Where one can check that the equality is achieved here for a DD1 Q. Okay. So, this is uh, you know a lower bound, a lower bound on the mean idle time. What we did? Because we know E of i equal to this quantity, since this quantity is less than or equal to 1, so this will be greater than or equal to the numerator 1, that is what we are written down here. right? Now, now we will try to derive an upper bound for Wq. right? What was Wq? Wq, we will use this inequality to derive the upper bound and we already know Wq is what this is what is the expression that we have just obtained. Okay. Now, what we do this expectation of i square, I am writing it in terms of variance and its expectation. That this is expectation of i square is variance plus expectation of i square that this particular quantity square, right? That is what we are writing it as e square. Okay. So, this is what it is, it is just that expectation of i square, I am writing it in this form. There is nothing else we are doing it here. Now, since this quantity is non-negative, right? For most distribution, it is strictly positive, but at least it's non-negative for all i. Now, this is non-negative, so the negative of this in the numerator, when you drop, it will this quantity will become bigger. So that is what you know you are getting it here, right? So Wq would be less than or equal to this remaining quantity minus times e square i divided by two times e of i which is you know if you this is just one you can cancel it out. So, this becomes minus times expectation of i minus this term that we already have here. Okay. That is we are not doing anything it is there up to this now. But expectation of i we already know in terms of u if you want to write it is what this is what that quantity is. So, this is basically minus e of i is equal to expectation of u by a naught and that is what this quantity is. So, this is now in terms of u everything you know we have obtained it now. Okay. But expectation of u is 1 by mu minus 1 by lambda which is less than 0 because of our assumption and a naught is less than or equal to 1. So, which implies that expectation of u less than as divided by a naught is less than or equal to this because this quantity is less than or equal to 1. Now, if I use that idea here, right? so this quantity would be less than or equal to expectation of u. So, that is all you wanted. So, this is what you have now. Okay? Now, what you can do? So, this is so this wq, what you are doing? wq already is less than or equal to this quantity. Now, we are replacing this by a still bigger quantity which is expectation of u. That is what this expression is. Now, what is this quantity? Now, you can cross multiply, you see that this is expectation of u whole square uh, minus expectation of u square divided by expectation of u, which is nothing but the numerator is nothing but minus times variance of u. right? Now, this is minus times variance of u. This quantity we already know it is this. So, minus times e of u is 1 by lambda minus 1 by mu and the variance of u is simply variance of s plus variance of t there will be some covariance term which will be 0 because we are assuming that the arrival process and the uh, departure process are all a uh, service process are all independent. So, that will the covariance term will go away. So, this is nothing but variance of s plus variance of t. right? So, that is what? So, variance of s is basically sigma square b, variance of t is sigma square a in our usual notation this is 1 by lambda minus 1 by mu which is lambda by you know 1 minus rho and two, 1 by 2 is all there. So, this is what is an upper bound. right? So, this is an upper bound which we have obtained now with respect to GG1Q using whatever the relationship and things whatever we have obtained here. right? We have obtained now an upper bound. Now, we can see in a similar fashion we can also obtain a lower bound. Again, you recall that Wq is basically expectation of x square minus expectation of u square by 2 times expectation of u. Okay. 
this is also we have not just uh, this expression but the other expression also we had right because from this step only we obtained this step so we are taking the previous step here we have to write this expression now if in this expression we can bound wq from below if we can bound uh, find a lower bound for this quantity if we can find a lower bound for this then we can find a lower bound for wq but how do we do that? We can see that we can recognize so what is this x? x definition is this quantity, right? xn is basically the minus times minimum of 0 and wqn plus u of n, u, u of un is what then we have here. Now, this quantity is stochastically smaller than t is what we are saying. Let us just see like what it means because x n is either 0 or this difference right x n would be either 0 or this quantity is what then you would obtain because u n is actually s n minus t n right. So, that is what would be minus of that would be t n minus s n minus w q n. So, this will be this. Now, you see here x n and T n you compare, x n and T n you compare. So, x n would be either 0 or this quantity which is basically something you have subtracted from this particular T right. So, that you know one can make uh, as to recognize that uh, this the distribution if I look at it now there will be more mass towards the left side of the distribution of x as opposed to the distribution of t right for the same value of t for the same value of t t will take exactly this value but this x will take either this or minus this right because this is it cannot go beyond that less than that right or even if it is the case that will still be true but it's a non negative quantity so we are looking at this quantity so, this will be something we have subtracted. So, the same mass or same probability will be distributed somewhat towards left of the point at which this T n takes the value. Okay. That is the understanding of the stochastically smaller you know, when you compare two random variables. As per definition what it means is we say that x is stochastically smaller than T you can take x and y does not matter. The distribution function of x is greater than or equal to the distribution function of t for all x and this is written as in this way. So, this is also called as stochastic ordering or stochastic comparisons in that literature. So, this is what when we say simply stochastically smaller means this is what we mean. What does that mean is this? So, if I draw a simple case if I if I have to look at suppose if I look at the you know one distribution function distribution function is suppose if I look at one distribution function is like this then the others distribution function would be something like this it will go. So, this will this will not exceed here right. So, that is what it would mean. So, here what you are seeing is this quantity the blue line is what basically this quantity right for all x when I pick it up this blue line lies above this purple line. So, that is what you know you would mean when you say x is stochastically smaller than t in this particular case right. And this is what precisely we mean when we say that uh, x is one variable is stochastically smaller than the other variable. So, in this particular case this is what uh, you are seeing. So, basically you are observing that x is sto stochastically smaller than t what that means is that because of this behavior now the higher moments for this would be smaller than the higher moments of this quantity that is what the implication right. So, expectation of x square would be less than or equal to expectation of t square. So, t here we are using it for the inter arrival time if you are using anything else that you know for this uh, lecture we are using that is what is the variable here ok. So, this is what it is. So, now if I take this equation that means now w q would be greater than or equal to this quantity expectation of t square 
because you are putting something which is bigger. So, this will be bigger than this quantity right and then it is just the mechanical working. Once I substitute this here then expectation of t squared is variance of t plus e squared of t this is variance of u minus the expectation of u squared divided by twice u. Now, this quantity minus variance of t this one again I am separating it out variance of t minus variance of s minus uh, expectations uh, of u square u of whole square. So, expectation of u is expectation of s minus t the whole square is what is this quantity is right. Now, this this will get cancelled variance of s where expert, exp, I mean expectation of t the whole square right that you just substitute the quantities here and simplify you will get this expression here right w q greater than or equal to lambda square sigma square b plus rho into rho minus 2 divided by 2 lambda times 1 minus rho. This is what you obtain it now as a lower bound right. So, w q here we have up, obtained an upper bound w q we have obtained as a lower bound, but with respect to this lower bound one thing you can observe is that this quantity it will be you know might become negative. So, in that case it makes no uh, sense at all it uh, does not or it is not useful in that sense right, but this is positive only if this condition is satisfied ok. So, and hence it is not uh, of always full value, but it is quite useful in many situations. So, one does keep this in mind in this case ok. Now, if I take a an m g 1 q with lambda equal to 1 and mu is equal to 2 which means rho is equal to half and if I plot this two quantities and this is what would look like in a typical way. What you are seeing this green line is the upper bound and this blue line is the lower bound and this red is what is the exact value because in this particular case by big p k mean value formula you can obtain the exact values in this particular case m g 1 with uh, lambda 1 which is Poisson process arrival, but only service time anyway service time variability is uh, involved in the uh, p k mean value formula. So, you can use to get the exact value. Now, you see how this values are looking like all of them are quadratic in the variance of service time distribution which is standard deviation which is sigma b is what then you are seeing it here ok. So, this is what you are observing. Now, this immediately should give a, a clue that suppose if I even in this particular case whether if I if I take a simple average of this lower and upper bound that should give me you know good enough uh, approximation for the actual value right. What I mean to say suppose this is the actual value right. Now, if I take this and this and if I take the average of these two points I will be somewhere closer to this. So, that might give you a good approximation. Of course, one has to study that for this is for rows equal to half uh, in which for which values of row this and like that, uh, but one can develop approximations which might hold in certain situations and under certain conditions that you know would be a quite good approximation. Then one can measure how good is the approximation and so on right, but visually at least from this figure you can easily see that you know the simple average itself for such rows in such situations when this g distribution is so complex that you are not able to do with business with m g m g 1 r even this m is gone and then you are looking at g g 1 even then case you know one can look at this kind of thing. So, one can take a simple approximation one can think right at least it gives an idea that you know one can think along those lines to get this ok. So, bounds helps in that way right it not just gives the worst case and best case scenario with respect to the quantities of your interest, but it can also helps you to uh, you know get going with construction of or you know creation of appropriate approximation techniques or certain heuristics if you are further using this in some optimization and so on that you know one it will be of quite uh, help when you are looking at the bounds. And this is what you know you see with this simple lower and upper bound 
Okay. But lawyer bound you know we have certain, certain reservations, but there could be another lawyer bound which can also be obtained. Um, now what we are assuming is that we are assuming the inter arrival and service time distributions both of them are known. Okay. But since in that you might ask suppose if this is the case then I can use uh, more information or if suppose if A is supposed to be Poisson, suppose if you assume that then I can use MG1 techniques and so on. One can or even with uh, some simple ATBT one can do a similar you know Linlay's uh, approach also one can do, but if it becomes too complex to do that. So, then you are left with no choice but to look for certain approximations and that is what one can look at it. Now, if I know the distribution whereas in the previous ones we did not use that we used only the mean quantities and variance quantities of even if you look at here sigma square a sigma square b and mean of uh, this a and b is what we have used to write to derive the lower and upper bounds in this particular case. But here we have, we have the complete distribution then whether one can get a better lawyer bound? Yes, possibly. So, this what is the another lawyer bound which one can obtain using these two distribution is basically this. Simply WQ would be greater than or equal to R naught and what is this R naught? This R naught is the unique non-negative root which exists when rho less than 1 which is when the system is stable of this f of z equal to 0. What is f of z? f of z is z minus integral minus z to infinity of the CCDF of the distribution of this u or CCDF of u or 1 minus the CDF of u right dt is what. So, where ut is the CDF of this s minus t right. You have s minus t Right. This is the service time distribution and this is the arrival inter arrival time distribution. So, this s minus t you have. So, you can get the distribution of this u. Now, once I get the distribution of this u, then this equation this is set equal to 0. There will be one can show that you know that the, there exists only a single root. Right single non-negative root for this function f of z one can show and then one can show that w q greater than or equal to r naught. This the proof is basically involves two step ok, uh, but we will not prove this above our session you know you can look at elsewhere for the proof or you can refer to the text because it is just a mechanical calculation of some two pages you have to go through right. But what is important is what is this r naught? r naught is the solution of this equation or the root of this equation which can be shown to be a unique non-negative root right. One can take f of 0 which will be less than 0 and f of some large value it will be positive. So, that will be it, it must cross the you know the axis at some point of time one can think and then you can look at greater than 0, less than 0, two different points. So, the in between it must cross once at least right. So, one can show all those, but nevertheless this is what is the bound. So, what is the bound here? W q is greater than or equal to R 0. Here R 0 will be non-negative root. So, it will never go below 0. So, this works out to be a better bound in many cases ok as you will see here ok. Now, finally, putting together all these things you have this relationship. What is that? W q is bounded between this quantity and this quantity. This is one lower bound we have obtained, this is another lower bound we have obtained right. It might be the scenario that you know one might do better than the other in some scenarios. So, and also it may become negative. So, to put that we put a 0 also. So, this is maximum of 0 r naught or this quantity is what is the lower bound and w upper bound is this quantity. Right. So, this is what is the final result for this W q. Now, once we have the bounds for W q appropriately one can get found for L q and other quantities and so on ok. Now, let us illustrate this even in the simple case of MM1 how it happens. So, we now apply this bounds to the MM1 q what happens we will see 
Uh, recall that while doing the Lindley's integral equation approach, we obtained the CDF of when we applied that to MM1, we obtained the CDF of u to be this quantity, u is s minus t, we obtained the distribution of s minus t to be this quantity. Now, that is what we are going to use. So, we know already this u of t. Now, the lower bound R naught in this particular case is found by solving this. Now, what is this quantity? is basically this expression right f of r naught equal to 0 r naught is solution of that. So, f of r naught equal to 0. So, that means 0 equal to f of r naught which is now u of t I know. So, I can substitute it here. So, this will be like uh, 40 less than 0 40 greater than equal to 0. So, I will get these two quantities as 1 minus of this and 1 minus of this which is what will give you this quantity and this quantity. And if I simplify, you will get this expression. Now, this must be equal to 0. So, this is non 0. So, this is what must be equal to 0 r mu square minus lambda square equal to mu square times e to the power minus r uh, r naught times lambda r 1 minus rho square equal to e to the power minus r naught. Hence, finally, r naught I can obtain to be this expression is what is the unique non negative root of this equation which will give me the lower bound. So, this is what it is. Now, see the upper bound if you compute for this it will turn out to be this. Uh, you can compute the other lower bound for this MM1 case and see what happens there. Okay? So, that is uh, you know for you to explore. You can be very easy like you know the because once you assume MM1 you know what is mean and variance. So, you just put it in the other bound and see what other bound means this quantity and see what happens here with this rho minus 2 terms and all what happens there. Okay? So, this is the upper bound, this is the lower bound and this is the upper bound for this MM1 case. So, if I plot this what you would observe is this kind of things. Okay? What you are seeing here both are not right lower bound is basically the blue line which is the R naught quantity this green is as earlier the upper bound and this red is the exact value right mm1 you know what is the exact value. Now, you know like this is plotted against rho wq is plotted against rho. So, this is what is turning out to be the upper bound and this blue line is what turning out to the lower bound. This asymptotic behavior is true of the upper bound for all gg1 q's in the sense that the bound gets asymptotically sharper closer to uh, when rho is higher. Okay. In turn, the lower bound gets sharper when rho is near to 0. This is not uh, you know true across, but in general this is what one would generally observe if you have you know really you know complex distributions for interarrival and so on. Okay. So, this is what one would observe like you know this also tends to infinity, but it will go at a slower rate than this one right. This goes very quickly and this one you know you see here this is very poor lower bound whereas here it will be poor upper bound in this particular case. This is a generic behavior, but it may not be true in all situations. MM1 is in some sense it is a little difficult or ideal situation. So, you will get slightly different results as here. Okay. So, this is what you would see if you apply this particular bound and this is what generic observations that one can make. Now, the point is that as you get more and more information about the intra arrival distribution or the service time distribution one can get better bounds. I mean that is how the other bound if you are computed it would have been meaningless in this particular case, but at least this blue line here it has given you know up to this good approximation or good close uh, to enough value to the exact value right that is what you know you are seeing it here. Okay. Let us take this simple example we have a gg1 system where the distributions are given in terms of empirical distribution means simple enough that intra arrival time takes two values 10 minutes with probability 2 by 5 and 15 minutes with probability 3 by 5. The service time is also 9 minutes with probability 2 by 3 and 12 minutes with probability 1 by 3. We are for the explicit purpose for a you know illustration purpose we are taking two point, but one could have many different points. 
Now once I have these values and the corresponding probabilities, I can obtain the mean variance you know, of these two distributions. It turns out that this is equal to the interval time, the variance is 6 and the service time, the variance is 2. Everything we at the time, we are taking it in terms of minutes. So, these are all square minutes and lambda is 1 by 13 and mu is 1 by 10 and rho is 10 by 13. Now, the upper bound which is very easy in terms of these known quantities. So, we can easily obtain to be 4 by 3 minutes is what is the upper bound for WQ. Now, we can obtain the lower bound since more information is there with respect to this, we will try to obtain the lower bound which is R naught here. So, we find what is that R naught? This is the non-negative root of this equation. Now, so to apply this equation, now then first I have to obtain u of t. So, that means I have to first obtain the random variable u, what values it takes. Remember, this t takes value 10 or 15 and s takes value 9 or 12, right. So, this u takes value minus 6 when s minus t, s is 9, this is 15, t is 15, you will get minus 6. So, that will happen with probability of the corresponding multiplication 2 by 3 into 3 by 5 which is equal to 2 by 5. Similarly, minus 3, two different values of s. So, you have only two values for s, two values of t. So, all four combinations will give you uh, four different values of minus 6, minus 3, minus 1 and 2, right. So, this is 9 minus 15 and the other one minus 3 you will get as 12 minus 15, you will get this as uh, minus 3 the, with the corresponding probabilities 1 by 5 and minus 1 with probability 4 by 5, 2 with probability 2 by 5, you can write immediately, right. Once I have the distribution of S and T, I can write down the distribution of u which is u takes value minus 6 with probability 2 by 5, minus 3 1 by 5, minus 1 with 4 by 5 and 2 with 2 by 15, so 4 by 15 and 2 by 15. Then I can obtain its distribution function, I can obtain its complementary distribution function which is 1 minus u of t which will be given by this expression, right, which is a mere calculation which you can obtain it. So, this is what you have to obtain. Now, I, can, I have to put that here and then I have to obtain this expression, right. But, so if I substitute inside that expression, right, that the integral alone, that expression alone, then I will get this expression, this minus R naught minus this integral alone we are trying to evaluate now, R naught minus we are keeping it, okay. So, this quantity is what we are trying to see for R naught between 0 and 1, 1 and 3, 3 and 6 greater than 6, you will obtain these expressions. You just plug it that 1 minus ut and integrate it, you will obtain these expressions, right. Now, we have to equate this to R naught and get the R naught, right. That is what f of z equal to 0 would give you. So, since what we observed is that upper bound is just over 1, so, the lower bound cannot be greater than the upper bound. So, we expect or we surmise that the lower bound should probably be less than 1 because it is 4 by 3 is the upper bound, so which falls into this region, okay. But uh, you know, so R naught could be some value which is lower than that 4 by 3 within this region or something in this region. So, we expect or we you know assume that you know this uh, R naught would be to be less than 1 and this quantity we take and then we solve R naught equal to this quantity to get R as 4 by 13 which must be correct because R naught is a unique non-negative solution to that equation. So, and obviously in this particular case you know you are not going to get anything also you, you can easily see here, right. So, if I equate this to R naught, I am not going to get anything, you can also see that, but and this is the only thing and then this is true and we theoretically also we know is the unique solution. So, once you obtain one value of R naught which is happening for some value of R naught, this quantity is equal to R naught, then that must be the solution and that is the correct solution which is 4 by 13. So, this is the unique non-negative solution, so therefore, finally, the lower bound is 4 by 13 as given here which is turning out to be 0 0.3077 minutes, WQ less than equal to 4 by 13 which is equal to 1.33 minutes, 
Now, it is possible to obtain the exact value in this particular case, but it is again it is a little bit longer working here and one can obtain that to be 0 0.37724. In this particular case, even though rho is what is the rho value is 10 by 3, right? We would expect that for higher values of rho this to be closer to the upper bound, but it is not really the case here, like it is very close to the lower bound rather than the upper bound here, right? So, that is what you are observing. So, this is the way one can use. So, at least your WQ you can bound between 0 0.30 and 1.33 is what then you are seeing it as uh, this WQ lying in between. Uh, that is what is the aim basically you want to obtain bounds for this, right. So, this is the way one can calculate even if you have any other distributions or any empirical distribution which is what practically in more situation that you would be having it, then one can do such calculations and obtain these bounds and so on, okay. Fine. So, this is what uh, we have for our G, G, 1, Q. Uh, what we have done is that we have considered in general and we have tried to do how one can analyze, but that is a very complicated theory. Complex means it involves complex analysis and transform inversions and so on. But one can obtain certain bounds in such situations. These bounds are quite useful in uh, many of these uh, practical situations because at the end of the day, no matter what do, what you do and mathematical model is itself is an approximation of uh, reality, right. So, you are putting one more layer of approximation to that to get this bounds, approximations and so on. To develop an approximation, one can also do your best case, worst case scenario analysis in many of the situations where you have to take certain decisions with respect to the, because it is a managerial decision that if you have to take. Right. So, then you can use these bounds in such situations. It has its own uses though sometimes the bounds may be off the mark in comparison to exact, but when you are not able to get exact, but at least some idea you can get from where to where it can lie. So, in this particular case whether what is going to be my WQ, whether it is going to be 2 minutes, 5 minutes, 7 minutes, I do not know, but at least I have some idea now that it is lies between 0 0.31 and 1.33 minutes some idea something is better than nothing, right. So, that is what you know you, you would obtain here, right. But this bounds as we said can be used to develop approximation, but which is not in our scope. So, we will leave it that, but one can explore if you want to do that, okay. So, this is all we have for our G, G1 cues and we will stop here. Thank you.